Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly. For those of you who are already here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice, while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realised before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody, and thank you again for joining us for today's online talk entitled Minority Shareholders' Right. My name is Clement. I'm a pupil with Mayan Grand Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Mayan Grand Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dato Mao. Our ABLE team today comprises of 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Dato Ma is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with SMEs, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment industrial relations team, and a department focusing on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for our clients, potential clients, and also in-house counsel. This is our sixth talk in our online talk series in 2022. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute any legal advice. In the event you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation, details of which will be given at the end of this talk. We have two speakers for today. Sebastian will be first speaking on shares, ownership, and rights of minority shareholders, and Gan will be speaking on oppression of minority shareholders and its release in cases of such oppression. We will then conclude with a Q&A session. Before starting today's talk, let, allow me to introduce our speakers for today. Gan is a partner in our dispute resolution department and was admitted to the Malaysian bar in 2019. He 
His area of practice include general litigation, debt recovery, wills, probate and administration, banking litigation, construction, arbitration, and etc. Sebastian is our associate of the dispute resolution department and is called to the English bar in July 2015 and further admitted to the Malaysian bar in 2018. He deals primarily with contentious corporate litigation and company law disputes. If you have any questions, please do not forget to type it down in the Zoom's Q&A chat box and we will try to attend to them after the talk. Without further ado, let me hand over the floor to Sebastian. Sebastian? Thank you, Clement, for the introduction. My name is Sebastian Liu, and I will be the first speaker for today's session. I will begin today's session by speaking briefly on shares and on shareholders. I will then proceed to speak on minority shareholders, corporate democracy, and what rights do the minority shareholders have in view of the majority rule principle. In Malaysia, a company may issue different classes of shares. The two common types of shares are ordinary, which typically forms the bulk of a company's capital and preference shares. Subject to the different class of shares, there are different rights attached to them. For example, fixed dividends is a typical feature for preference shares or voting rights for ordinary shares. Under Section 2 of the Companies Act 2016, shares means the issued share capital of a corporation. And shares, sometimes also referred to as equities or stocks, are instruments denoting some form of ownership of the company issuing them. A shareholder, sometimes also referred to as a member, can be either an individual or a non-human legal entity like a company. A shareholder can be a person or a legal entity whose name is entered in the register of members as the holder for the time being of one or more shares in the company. A shareholder is still often considered an owner or part owner of the company where the owner's share is represented by the portion of the owner's capital injected into the company. However, in the case of limited liability in company law, Shareholders do not own any of the company's assets directly and are neither directly liable for the company's debts. So in general, their exposures are confined to the extent of their investments and are insulated from corporate debts. The company itself is liable for its debts, save and except for limited circumstances where the corporate veil can be lifted. This perhaps may be a topic for a different session, but what is important to note here is that shareholders are typically not directly liable for a company's debts. As mentioned in my previous slide, the liability of a company is limited and ring-fenced to the company itself and generally does not extend to the shareholders and the directors. The shares only give their holders for the time being some typical rights, normally those to dividends, voting in shareholders' meetings, surpluses to liquidation, and corporate information during annual general meetings. Shareholders do not have a direct say in the management of the company. This is left exclusively to the board of directors of the company at most, the shareholders' involvement in the management of the company is the right to vote at general meetings, to reconstitute the board, or to appoint or to remove directors. So what exactly is a minority shareholder? A minority shareholder, as the name suggests, is a shareholder with a non-controlling stake of less than 50% of a company's voting shares. By virtue of holding a minority interest in a company, a minority shareholder does not have sufficient voting power to exert control over a company or to have significant influence over the direction of the company. However, the mere fact that a minority shareholder does not have sufficient control over a company is not in itself oppressive. Similar to sovereign democracy, corporate democracy is also bound by one of the fundamental principles of company law and good co corporate governance, which is the majority rule. This rule enforces that the will of the majority prevails over and above individual shareholders' interests. The majority rule and corporate democracy. The general rule of the majority rule is that the minority will have to subscribe to the rule of the majority. As a general principle, minority shareholders must continue to accept the principle of the majority rule. In the Privy Council decision in Rikong Tai Sawmill, Lord Wilberforce held that the mere fact that one or more of those managing the company possess a majority of the voting power and, in reliance upon that power, make policy or executive decisions with which the complainant does not agree, is not enough. Those who take interest in companies limited by shares have to accept majority rule. It is only when the majority rule passes over into rule oppressive of the minority or in disregard of their interests that the section can be invoked. 
Therefore, only if the majority does act in a manner that is oppressive or the affairs of the company is being conducted in a manner that is unduly prejudicial to the shareholder's interests, the minority shareholder in such instances may be entitled to bring a claim for oppression under Section 346 of the Companies Act 2016 to redress the balance of power. Accordingly, the prejudice and unfairness must be properly evidenced in order for the complainant to succeed in such an application. Based on my previous slides, the principle of the majority rule, if read in isolation, may appear to render or relegate a minority shareholder's role in the company if redundant. Accordingly, the majority can dictate the commercial direction of a company, confining the minority's involvement in such process to a mere formality. The scale favors the majority, and the minority will constantly be outvoted by virtue of having a non-controlling interest in the company. Whilst a minority shareholder neither has sufficient voting shares nor a controlling interest in a company, the Companies Act nonetheless affords the minority certain basic rights and powers. So what rights do minority shareholders have? For example, a, minor, a member or a class of member holding more than 25% shares in a company can block special resolutions. Special resolutions are basically resolutions passed by a majority of not less than 75% of members or a class of members, either in person or by proxy at a meeting of members. Therefore, shareholders that hold more than a quarter of the company's share, whilst not the controlling majority, are able to significantly influence and have the power to block important decisions a company may wish to make. As the Companies Act 2016 requires a 75% vote to pass certain resolutions, the minority of 25% plus shares may block the adoption of or any amendments to the company's constitution, the alteration or reduction of the share capital of the company, the variation of class rights of members in a class, a voluntary winding up petition, and the removal of a liquidator. So in the next six slides, I'll be going through six other rights and entitlements a minority shareholder has in prescribed circumstances as provided in the Companies Act 2016. These rights extend beyond merely blocking resolutions by the majority members. The first of six rights are that a minority member has the right to oppose variation of class rights. Briefly, a variation of class rights mean the rights that are attached to shares in a class of members are varied where in such circumstances, the entire class of members may, amongst others, for example, see changes in their voting rights, their rights to dividends, etc. If the rights attached to shares in any class of shares in a company are varied, a member or a class of members holding at least 10% or more in a class may apply to court to have a variation of class rights disallowed. In such circumstances, the minority member all members are able to influence the outcome of a variation despite having a non-controlling interest in a company. The applicant must satisfy the court that the variation would unfairly prejudice the shareholders in order to obtain an order to disallow the variation. If the court is however satisfied that the variation would not unfairly prejudice the shareholders, naturally the court may make an order to confirm the variation. This is not oppressive. The second right is a minority member's right to have general meetings. Minority members may convene or requisition meetings of members to table a resolution or to propose resolutions to be voted on at a meeting of members. Therefore, a member holding or representing at least 10% of the issued share capital may convene a general meeting of the company themselves without involving the board of directors. Alternatively, a member holding or representing at least 10% of the issued share capital of the company has the statutory right and power to require the directors to convene a meeting of members. In such circumstances, the directors are obliged to call for a meeting within 14 days once the company has received the requisition and to hold the meeting on a date not more than 28 days after the date of the notice to convene the meeting. The third right, a minority member has the right to demand a poll at a general meeting. A poll vote is a procedure where the votes on a resolution are calculated by reference to the number of shares held by members pre present at the meeting. So in short, every shareholder or proxy has one vote for every ordinary share held on a poll on any resolution of a company. 
as a general background, the default position in Malaysia is that voting on a resolution is to be decided at a general meeting by a show of hands, unless a poll is demanded. A poll may be demanded by minority members at a meeting of members, and accordingly, the minority members may influence the voting procedure at general meeting of the, as per the Companies Act 2016, a member with not less than 10% or one-tenth of the total voting rights of all members in the company is able to demand a poll vote at a general meeting of the company. A company's constitution or articles of association is void if it were to restrict the right to demand a poll at a general meeting or making ineffective a demand for a poll. Therefore, if a poll is correctly requested by members during the meeting, the chairman is obliged to comply with the request. If a chairman improperly refuses to take a poll where it has been properly requested, then in such circumstances, any resolution passed on a show of hands will be deemed to be invalid and ineffective. The fourth right, a minority member has the right to inspect every service contract of directors of a public company. Typically, such service contracts are kept in the registered office of the public company. A member holding at least 5% of the total paid up capital of a public company having share capital has the right to request and inspect the service contract of any of its directors. If the public company does not have share capital, then at least 10% of members may request for this. The member entitled to inspect is entitled to be provided with a copy of a director's service record, uh, service contract, sorry, within seven days from the date the request is received by the company. If the minority member's request for inspection is refused, the court may order or compel an immediate inspection or may direct that the copy required is sent to the member requiring it. The fifth right is that a minority member has the right to prevent the reappointment of an auditor in a private company. Under the Companies Act 2016, where the office of an auditor becomes vacant and no auditor has been appointed, the auditor who holds office immediately before shall be deemed reappointed. However, Members or even minority members may prevent this deemed reappointment or resolve that the auditor should not be reappointed. Members representing at least 5% of the total voting rights of, a, of all members can prevent the reappointment of an auditor of a private company. The minority members will be entitled to vote on a resolution that the auditor should not be reappointed and would be able to influence the same. So the foregoing rules which I've just mentioned do not apply to public companies. An auditor of a public company shall be appointed by the board of directors of the company for each financial year or to fill a casual vacancy in the office of the auditor. A member in a public company does not have veto rights on this issue. This is ultimately left in the hands of the directors. The sixth and the final right is that a minority member has the power to require the circulation of a written resolution. A member of a private company representing not less than 5% of the total voting rights of all eligible members may require the company to circulate a resolution that may properly be moved as a written resolution. A company is required to circulate the written resolution and any accompanying statement, not more than 1,000 words, on the subject matter of the written resolution once the company has received a request to do so from the member representing not less than 5% of the total voting rights this request must be made in hard copy or electronic copy and must be authenticated by the member making the request. Failure to do so may result in the request being rejected or properly recorded. This again is not oppressive. To recap, the majority rule is a fundamental principle of company law. This is the general position. However, you may be wondering when can a minority shareholder bring a claim for oppression? A short answer to that question pulsating in everyone's head is basically in circumstances where the majority rule has been abused. If abused, Section 346 of the Companies Act 2016 affords minority shareholders the necessary tool to combat such unfair treatment. To clarify, an aggrieved shareholder in such situations will be litigating under his or her own personal capacity as a shareholder of the company and not in the capacity of the company. Ultimately, the legal test for oppression is whether there is commercial unfairness in the treatment of shareholders. And in short, commercial unfairness is assessed on a case-to-case -case basis, taking into consideration a variety of factors that include the relationship in issue, the expectations of the parties, any existing agreements, or any common understanding between the members of a company.
On that note, I will now pass the baton over to my co-speaker, Gan, who will be speaking more on section 346 and on what amounts to a minority shareholder oppression and the remedies the courts in Malaysia can grant when dealing with oppression. Thank you. Gan? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Clement, for the warm introduction. I will continue with what amounts to oppression and also the relief that the court will provide in cases of oppression. So what's the definition of oppression? Under Section 346 uh, of the Companies Act, any member or debenture holder of a company may apply to the court for an order under this section on the ground that the affairs of the company are being conducted or the powers of the directors are being exercised in a manner oppressive to one or more of the members, including himself or in disregard of his or their interest as members, shareholders, or debenture holders of the company. 346 sub 1 sub B, the company states that some of the act of the company has been done or is threatened or that some resolution of the members or any class of them has been passed or is proposed which unfairly discriminate against or is otherwise prejudicial to one or more of the members. So that's the legal definition of what is an oppression. What amounts to act of minority oppressions are dealt with from a case-to-case -case basis as explained by Sebastian and it's not exhaustive. So uh, case law develops and the courts have generally held that the following situation or instances are acts of oppression. So A, misappropriation of assets belonging to a company, withholding certain types of information from the members, diversion of monies to the majority shareholders at the minority's expense, mismanagement of the company, failure to pay adequate dividends, exclusion of certain class of members from management, and G, dilution of shares. Again, these examples are not exhaustive. There may be other examples and depending from a case-to-case -case basis. A case law on misappropriation of assets. In Chuzi Sun against cast iron products, uh, the petitioner filed an oppression petition and the allegations against the directors were that no proper accounting, there were misappropriation by directors of the company funds, unauthorized disposal of assets of the company by the directors, tax mismanagement, loss of assets and absence of dividend. The court, upon considering the merits uh, of the case, found that there were misappropriation of funds and held that the tenth amounts to oppression. B, on withholding certain types of information. So in the case of Tan Kien Hua, the petitioner's grievances are as follows. That there was irregular financial transactions by the second, third and fourth respondents. There was a breach of agreement to repay the loan taken by the petitioner. And that the petitioner was prevented from having access to the company's accounts. The petitioner was also removed as a director of the company in breach of the agreement and the dividends were also not declared. Besides that, the petitioner was also stripped from enjoying all the benefits of the company and denied access to the office. So uh, essentially in Tan Kien Hua, what happened was the company's account was initially handled by the second respondent's wife. So all the accounts, cash book, general ledgers, journals, books, and working papers were kept in the second respondent's house. The petitioner made numerous requests to inspect the books and the accounts, but was denied access, were not given copies or to actually inspect the accounts, despite the fact that assurances were given by the second respondent and also the wife. So in this case, the court held that the withholding certain types of information as in uh, the circumstances in Tan Kien Hua's case, uh, the court held that that was oppression. Next is on diversion of monies to majority members. So in the case of Heng Ye Li against Chia Cheng Lan, the respondents in breach of their fiduciary duties transferred shares which they held for the company in company A. The respondents in the board of directors meeting on two occasions further resolved to lend out monies to company A free of interest. So in this case, the court held that it was oppression. On mismanagement of the company, in the case of a, holder, a shareholder holding less than 3% of the issue shares successfully petitioned to the court for the estate to be sold to a third party. The directors of the company had neglected the tea plantation belonging to the company by failing to pay the quit rent and it had deteriorated to such an extent that 
the danger of it becoming a scrub land. In this case, the court held that the defendant having mismanaged the company amounts to an oppression. Failure to pay adequate dividends is also a ground uh, to petition under uh, minority oppression. So in the Singapore case of Ri Gi Ho, Ri Gi Ho Chan Trading, the court granted the winding out of the company when the respondents used their controlling power in both the general meetings and the board of directors to adopt policies which benefited themselves. The directors paid themselves high salaries but refused to declare dividends payout to the shareholders. Further, the non-declaration of dividends was by the respondents, was by the petitioners that it was done to actually punish the petitioners. In the Singapore case, the court held that the failure to pay adequate dividends Notwithstanding that the directors were actually benefited and paid a higher salary amounts to an oppression. These principles had actually also been applied in the Malaysian case of uh, Dato Ting Chek Si. However, in this case, in the Malaysian case, the, upon applying the principles from the Singapore case, the court held that the, the conducts uh, that was raised or alleged in the Dato Ting's case does not constitute oppression. There, the petitioner, even though was the petition was not made a managing director, but was still a director, and there were disagreements on the managerial decisions and policies. There, the court held that the decision to make him a director but not a managing director was not oppressive, and the disagreement on manager decisions and policies are commercial decisions made by the company, and they do not amount to minority oppression or oppressive conduct. Hence, the case of Dato Ting Chik Si can clearly show that what amounts to oppressive conduct is really uh, on a case-to-case -case basis. F, on the exclusion of class members from management, the earlier case that was mentioned, Tan Kian Hua, the petitioner was removed as a, as a director in the re-election and had to retire under the company's articles of association, but no reason was given. Here, the court held that the exclusion of the petitioner from the management of the company constituted a breach of an understanding to allow him to participate in the company's management. The dilution of shares. Dilution of shares is also considered as an oppressive conduct. So in the case of Chang Ying against Lao Chong and Sons, here the plaintiff held 52% shareholding in the company. And the second defendant and her father allotted 157,000 shares. As a result of the allotment, the plaintiff's shareholding was reduced to 42% and was no longer the majority. The plaintiff alleged that the purpose of the allotment was to dilute the plaintiff's majority. So in this case, the court held that under Article 5 of the company's Articles of Association, the power to allot and issue shares must be used for purpose in good faith. And the court held that this act was done in contravention of that purpose. Hence, a dilution of shares without any basis or a basis that is not substantiated, the court will find the dilution as an oppressive. Next, we will dive into what are the reliefs in cases of oppression. So what can you, or what remedies can you actually ask from the court when faced with an oppressive conduct? So section 346 provides the remedy in cases of an oppression. So here, if on such application, the court is of the opinion that either of those grounds is established, the grounds in, in section one established, the court may make such order as the court thinks fit with a view to bringing to an end or remedying the matters complained of and without prejudice to the generality of section one. So the order here may be direct or prohibit any act or cancel or vary any transaction or resolution that was made, regulate the conduct of the affairs of the company in future, provide for the purchase of the, of the shares, of the company by other members or the ventures holder of the company or by the company itself. So here, for example, the order could be for the majority shareholder to purchase the shares of the minorities. So in the case of a purchase of shares by company, provide for a reduction according to the capital of the company or provide that the company be worn up. As we can see from section 346, the legislation has worded or drafted the act that the court has the jurisdiction to grant other relief as it thinks fit. So as it thinks fit includes discretion to grant relief which the petitioner did not ask. So for example, if the petitioner did not ask for certain relief and the court is of the opinion that 
a certain relief if it's clearly for the benefit of that matter, the court will grant that decision or grant that order. This was also provided in Datuk Kanapian, the case where the court held that the court retains a wide discretion to grant any and all relief that is considered fit in the circumstances. Again, despite the wide discretion given to the court to grant any relief, the court has to consider also the legal test uh, that was uh, mentioned by Sebastian. So whether whether is whether there is a good commercial decision to actually make that decision before granting it, and whether is it fair to the parties in granting that order. So that's all from for me. So we will take questions from the audience. Thanks to Michelle and Gun for your insights in shareholding and the oppression of minority shareholders. Like Gun mentioned, we will now take any questions that you might have in the Q and A chat box. If you wish to ask any questions, please do type them in the Q and A chat box, and we will try to answer them to the best of our ability. From the first question, it regards to the attendee asked if a retail investor who buy the share, shares through a nominee company, who should initiate a oppression action as the shares is not theirs in the first place and they are just holding the shares on behalf of the individual shareholder. I think ultimately the question is asking if someone buys share through a nominee company, who should initiate the oppression action? Yeah, Sebastian, can I hand over the question to you? Or Gan, if anyone. So in such circumstances, right, the nominee will bring the action because the shares is registered under the nominee's name. So this retail investor would have to consult the, have a general meeting to call for, depending on what's his relationship with the nominee company. So perhaps you can be, give us some details on that. Then we can answer it better. But the short answer is the nominee will have to bring the action, not the retail investor. Thank you, Sebastian. You can email us if you want. We can see what we can do. Thanks, Sebastian. The second question is by Lawrence. His question is, does a minority shareholder has a right to request for inspection of documents, such as contracts agreements being awarded to contractors? Do any of the panelists want to cover the question? In short, shareholders do not have a right to request for any documents, records of the company. Only directors can do so. Thanks. And the next question we have is, what are the interim reliefs available to minority shareholders? I'm guessing aside from what we have just mentioned just now, which is to bring an oppression action. I'll take this question, Clement. What interim relief will depends on what actually transpired or what's the issue at hand? Could be maybe an injunction perhaps. It really depends on, on the situation of the case, on what do you want to achieve? And then to tailor the so-called interim relief. Thanks, Gan. I'm just looking at the Q&A chat box for any final questions. We have another one by Nick. His question is, would a refusal to purchase shares from the minority shareholders amount to an oppressive conduct? Does any of the panelists want to take it up? Generally, no. So once you try to sell a share to another shareholder, the company would have to approve the share sale. So the company refusing to accept to, to approve the share sale or other shareholders refusing to purchase the shares from the minority shareholder in itself is not an oppressive conduct. But of course, you have to build a case. You, you may be able to offer the shares to the other shareholders at a, the right of first refusal. And perhaps if they refuse to buy, you can build a case on that. But that's dependent on its facts itself. Thank you so much, Sebastian. I think that's it for the Q&A questions that we have today. Allow me to close by sharing our upcoming talks. Before we conclude, just a few announcements. First, please join us again on the upcoming talk happening on the 25th of May on the topic on differentiating between employees and independent contractors in order to avoid unfair dismissal claims. Second, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk in order for us to improve in our upcoming talks. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. Do follow or like our social media accounts for you to keep updated on our, happen our upcoming activities such as our online talk. And lastly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website, the link which will be posted in the chat box as well. There is a QR code on the screen, which I believe that you may be able to see. To our guests, thank you for joining us. 
And we hope you have found today's session informative and useful. And until we see you again, take care and bye-bye.